So good morning. We're going to talk for a few minutes this morning about money and finding meaning in life. Um, my name is <laughs> my name is Amy Butler. I'm um, an American Baptist minister. I most recently was the senior minister at the Riverside Church in the city of New York, which is the tallest church in America which was built by John Rockefeller. And there is so much money steeped into the stones of that traditional institution and the people who attend there. Uh, I started my career 20 years ago running a homeless shelter in the city of New Orleans. And what I have noted over these 20 years is this pull to find meaning and purpose in our lives is really, um, separate from how much money we have. We all need it. It's a human, it's a human drive. And um, the founding pastor of the Riverside Church was Harry Emerson Fosdick in 1930, and he wrote this, we cannot live without faith because the prime requisite in life's adventure is courage, and the sustenance of courage is faith. So it occurs to me, having been here this week and talking to so many of you who are doing courageous and amazing things, that there has to be some kind of well of faith or whatever word you want to use for it um, that we pull on to sustain us in, in the difficulty of this work. So I'm delighted to have two wonderful colleagues with me today, Craig and Angie, and I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about their fascinating work. Craig, would you like to go first? Hello, good morning, everyone. So I have spent this year uh, conducting slow and long conversations with people in the social entrepreneurial space. I'd like to share two stories that I've encountered. One I did not encounter in an interview, and one I did. So the first story is Jordan Casalo's story. He founded Vision Springs, which is the pretty large uh, social entrepreneurship that affiliates with Warby Parker and helps to distribute glasses, uh, reading glasses, in the um, developing world through micro-entrepreneurship. But Jordan tells this story about why he became a social entrepreneur. He was 23, he was in Alaska with some buddies, and they ran into really bad weather, uh, and they were in their tents for a couple of days, and he just got sick of it finally, and said, guys, I'm going out for a hike. And if I don't come back in such and such a time, please come and get me. There are grizzlies and pretty bad weather. So he was up in the mountains, and the rain was coming sort of horizontal. And he had this overwhelming sense that the universe was speaking to him. And he didn't like the message. The message was, you don't matter. And he said, I knew in my heart that I did matter. And somehow I had to prove that. So he went on a, on a kind of service trip into Mexico, and he, in, he's an optometrist, and he encountered a, a, a boy who was blind, and he realized after a few minutes that the boy wasn't blind, but actually uh, was very farsighted, if I've got this right. It might have been nearsighted. I always get those two mixed up. And he put reading glasses on the eyes of the boy, and for the first time in the child's life, he could see. And Jordan said he looked, up at the, <laughs> he looked up at the heavens and said, see, I do matter. And he started Vision Springs. That's my first story. My second story is one I encountered in an interview, and it changed the course of my research, this kind of story. Uh, Charlie Branda it, it lived on Sedgwick Avenue in Chicago for a long time. She was a banker. She's a, a white woman. Um, and she, one day a young black man got shot outside of her house. She, I think she had been in the, in, on this street for a decade or so. And she said, I didn't even know to whom to take a casserole. And so she decided to quit her job as a banker and to start an art studio, which is still running today, called Art on Sedgwick. And it's a studio for, that specifically seeks to get 
um, black people and white people and people of any color to come together and make stuff. Uh, this often is sort of geared towards children, but I, when I visited, there were, it was a dance night and there were all kinds of people, adults there. And I have been musing over this year about the difference between those two stories. They're both deeply spiritual stories. They're both stories that, that have a, a spiritual dimension to them. Jordan Casalo will talk about angels that will guide you. And Charlie uh, is a Christian who has, uh, for the moment and for the time, left her church. Um, and so over the course of this year, I've been asking, like, what's the difference in the spirit of those two stories or the, the role of the spiritual in, in those two stories? I think there is an important difference, um, but my research has been an, an attempt to sort of frame the, the, the difference in spirituality there. Um, I think the first story is maybe a bit more common, the sort of story of epiphany and awakening and born-againness. Uh, I think the second story may be a richer and more collective and more complex story, a little harder to pay attention to, but um, just as important. So that's a start. Thanks. Angie? Thank you, Craig and Amy. Uh, so as a, a little bit of background on my story and how I came to be here since we are engaging in the question of meaning. Uh, I grew up in a home that was religiously unaffiliated but with one parent from a Christian background and one from a Jewish background and I was raised to believe that becoming closer to uh, to the divine and more useful to other people, that this was the orienting point for life, but I was not raised in the context of a religious community or container, and so that spirituality of living love as it was engendered in me was something that was mine to pursue and to find others who were engaged in that pursuit as well. And so that guided me uh, through into my 20s when I was living as a playwright in Brooklyn and trying to find where other people who were orienting their lives around uh, living love were doing that. And I had never been part of a religious community in the traditional sense, and so it didn't even occur to me to look there. So I went looking in other places, like arts communities and maker spaces and fitness communities and justice movements and started to notice that there were a lot of common threads that seemed to be running through those spaces even though nominally they were doing very different things. And so that question and the discovery that I was, what I came to learn uh, was an unaffiliated millennial. This was language that I didn't know about myself but that was I soon learned a label that I carried. Uh, I remember learning about the phrase spiritual but not religious on Match.com in 2009 <laughs> because everyone I got matched with seemed to have that and I was like, maybe I should go where those people are. Uh, so I, I kind of, I grew into a set of identities and then started to discover that these identities were rampant in the United States and that among, I'm a millennial elder, I'm 34, um, but that amongst my generation and then increasingly amongst Gen Z and those younger than me, that the... Um, the, the pace at which people were disaffiliating from religion or just never had inherited one at all um, was rapidly growing. And so I became so fascinated by these trends that I ended up going to divinity school to pursue them. And this is as someone who, I didn't know what divinity school was. I had never read the Bible. I didn't know what liturgy was. These This whole language and this context was unfamiliar to me, but I knew that there seemed to be threads about meaning and belonging and purpose that were worth pursuing. And so I then had the great good fortune to meet a fellow student named Casper Turkile, and the two of us ended up interviewing community leaders all over the country, whether it was CrossFit and SoulCycle um, and other fitness communities, whether it was Artisans Asylum, the makerspace down the street from us, and we would go participate as well, you know, and try to get an understanding of what was happening there. And through that work, we ended up writing a report called How We Gather in 2015 that drew together some of the themes that felt like DNA of the communities we got to know. Themes like personal transformation and purpose finding and social change and 
accountability was a huge one, which fascinates me still, that people longed to be in a space where they were called to account and seen for not only the person that they were, but the person that they aspired to be. Um, so it was things like that with this river of community run, running under it. And I've become protective of this word community um, as the experience of being deeply known and deeply loved, right? That you're actually in deep enough relationship with people that you not only know about the highs and lows of their life, but you're in a place to show up for them, right? It connects to the story you told, uh, Craig. So Angie, w what would you say about my theory that this is a fundamental human need to, to find meaning in a deeper way? Did you find that in your work? I would, I would confirm your hypothesis. <laughs> yes, and uh, the word connection I use a lot as well, uh, but that, that, that meaning and connection are as, um, they're as fundamental to humans as the need for water and air, and that we die without it. That's, that's been my sense. Wow. Craig, you're a professor and a researcher. And you have, in your work, identified some practices of social entrepreneurs, spiritual practices. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to that curiosity and what you've found? So I had a student in a, in a rhetoric class of about 10 years ago. I guess this was 2007. Um, raise her hand. It was a tiny class, I think four students. And so she probably didn't have to raise her hand. She just spoke up and said, have you heard of Product Red? And I hadn't, but Bono and Bobby Shriver's campaign uh, sort of bringing together commerce and do-gooding uh, was baffling to me. And so I spent like three or four years just studying the rhetoric of red. And I came to see that it wasn't the most admirable expression of this intersection of trying to find money and meaning, or meaning and money, um, but that it was uh, expressive of a larger phenomenon and sometimes a subtler phenomenon. So I started to study social entrepreneurship. And that's when I noticed that, wow, a lot of, and I was not, uh, you know, honest, I wasn't looking for it, but a lot of people wanted to talk about spirituality that, that I, I, I ran into. So I was like, okay, I guess I will too. And uh, so that's how I came to sort of be interested in spiritual practices. Um, the practices that I would ask people about, I, sometimes people were reticent uh, to get into a conversation, understandably. Um, it's a deeply personal topic. So I would show them this kind of clunky PowerPoint slide, just sort of flip my laptop around, say, hey, look at this, what do you think of these things? Do you do any of these things? And often the most reticent people would say, oh yeah, well, I do that. Yeah, I guess I do that too. I do that too. And uh, so I would ask them about mindfulness, uh, generosity, um, critique, uh, celebration, and wisdom seeking. And that's sort of how I would prime the pump. It was an unscientific list. It, it was just sort of my guesses as to what people were doing. But often enough, the, the guesses came through. And what, what is the general response when you identify those practices as spiritual practices? So most people, uh, at least in the socially entrepreneurial sector that I've talked to, um, I guess I've talked to now something like 40 people on a, on a kind of formal academic interview basis, you know, many other people in less formal ways. But um, most people were willing to say, yeah, those those there is a spiritual dimension in my work and those practices help me pay attention to that. Some people, just a few, were pretty unwilling to use that term spiritual um, and there was just a, a kind of reticence in them. But I think you and I were talking about this the other day, Amy. E uh, even so, at the end of the conversations, almost everybody, I, I'm, I'm an academic, so let me be really careful. Many people would say, this felt really good to talk about felt really good. Even those people who weren't willing to use that term spiritual were, were somehow sort of enthused uh, and, um, uh, I don't know, encouraged uh, by just the chance to talk about this dimension of their work. We mentioned this yesterday, but of course, being a traditional ordained minister, pastor of a church, I'm interested always in the role that community plays in these practices. And Angie, I know that's been the focus of a lot of your work. Can you talk about um, how important community is to finding meaning and purpose? 
Yeah. One of the amazing communities I've gotten to know the last couple of years is a group called Nuns and Nuns. And I'll tell, I'll respond to your question through a story from there. Um, so, you know, the, those sociologically, those who are religiously unaffiliated are often referred to as nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And then uh, Catholic sisters, at least who are cloistered, are called nuns, N-U-N-S, right? And so there emerged over time this conversation between really neither of the names are accurate, but it's between sort of spiritually diverse millennials and then Catholic sisters um, who discovered that they had a common interest really in social change um, and that these sisters had been kind of at the edge of their institution for a long time. And often these millennials, many of them activists, also felt at the edge in some way of their context. And so they started coming together for conversation. And at one point, one of the millennials just kind of just had a moment and was like, you know, all I want to do is like, grow who I am as a person in the context of community to serve the world. And the sister looks at him and says, my brother, that is what we call religious life. <laughs> um, but it was such a sweet moment of connection and kinship. And I think, you know, as I've gotten to know so I've gotten to know these leaders, right? So say it's um, a soul cycle instructor who is being asked suddenly to perform weddings or who's getting text messages on a Saturday of someone asking, should I put my kid on ADD medication, right? They're, because people are so at a loss for community, we have this crisis of isolation in this country, they are bereft and so they go looking anywhere they can find it. So suddenly you have people where the only Commu the only experience of close to deep community they have is at their soul cycle. And so then they're treating the leader of that space as a pastor. And so as we started getting to know these leaders, whether it was from the worlds of the arts or fitness or grief and loss or justice, they would they would attest to the fact that they often created, they, they either founded or stepped into leadership in this community to fill a need they themselves felt, which was often for connection, um, and that then they ended up being set apart because they were serving the life needs of people who were bringing their whole lives to the community that they served. And so they started asking, how do I deepen my own well so I can go deep with the people in my care? So suddenly this divinity school education I was getting became relevant to a whole group of people that a place like Harvard Divinity School isn't even considering as part of its potential population. Um, and yet, these folks are stepping into these roles, and I think it speaks to this question of how deeply we crave community. And when we find ourselves in a space of shallow community, I think it's part of the portrait of what's happening in this country right now is that we long for the depth, but sometimes that gets distorted into basically fear-based community, which is to say, rather than uniting around being part of something bigger than ourselves, we will unite around a common enemy. Which is what a lot of Christian expression in the traditional sense yeah. in our country in this moment is. You know, in my field, inside the institutional church, there's a lot of panic right now because every, every institution we know is in complete decline as it should be because we are not we are not meeting the needs of this population of you know what what the church should be offering um so i want to ask you another question about that but before we move on to that what are the qualities of these communities that you've identified yeah so i think at 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 best, you know, when they're really serving the spiritual well-being of the people in the care of these communities. Um, you know, over the years we've identified some smaller or some more specific themes, but I think it really falls into three big categories. And we talk about it as meeting the needs of the soul. Uh, and the first being the need for belonging or the experience of being deeply known and deeply loved. And not only receiving, but giving, right, that you are one who is in, you are offering that experience of witness, accompaniment, and love to others, and you are also receiving it. Um, 
the next being becoming or growing into the people we're called to be. So that discovery of our gifts and then the opportunity to give them and to receive the gifts of others. And then beyond, which we just talk about as the experience of being part of something more. Or sometimes we'll talk about it as the experience of feeling fully big and fully small, right? Which gets to that story I think you mentioned with Jordan. Um, so I think when those experiences are operative in a community, that is when you start to feel that deep sense of meaning and connection. Now, those are big abstract concepts, but on the ground, I think, um, you know, Paul Bourne wrote a book called Deepening Community, and he talks about the chicken soup test uh, of whether you could bring chicken soup to a neighbor. The reality is that you have to know quite a bit in order to do that. Not only know a lot, but then you have to make the choice to do it. Uh, but is, do you have to know, you have to know your neighbor. You have to know them well enough to know if they're sick. You have to know if they're a vegetarian. <laughs> you have to know if they're home. And then on top of that, you have to be invested enough in their life that you would actually take that leap of, of bringing them chicken soup. So I think, you know, it, while it resides in these big <laughs> concepts, it plays out on the ground. What happens to us when we don't have a community like that? I mean, this is one of the primary things that I attribute to the deaths of the despair in this country right now. I mean, I think that our rampant anxiety and depression and suicide and the fact that it's going up and up and up among Gen Z. There was a devastating article by Varun Soni, the chaplain at USC recently about the crisis of loneliness on college campuses. And he said when he started 11 years ago as chaplain, um, people would come in asking things like, you know, these classic questions of how then shall I live? You know, it's like, how do you find meaning and purpose? And he said, it's now taken a devastating turn where students are asking, why should I live? And he said, they never used to come in asking a question he now gets every week, which is how do I make friends? You know, this just basic um, uh, experience with connection and kinship is rapidly declining. So I think that's, that's some of the things that happen. In a minute, we're, we're going to open the mic and love to have comments or questions for anybody on the panel. But um, my bias, of course, is the institutional church. And I think when the institution shows up in its best way to provide this, we're providing narrative and community and ritual. Right. What is there a place for religious inst institutions as we have understood them in this moment and with this population? Should I start? Will I have a job in the future? <laughs> <laughs> this is a freighted question. Uh, seems likely, Amy. Seems likely. Um, so one of the sort of thematics that I've noticed through talking to social entrepreneurs um, is that their companies, their organizations, often function in a church-like way. Um, and so they... Not infrequently, they have left, uh, at least temporarily, organized religion. They've left their community in which they grew up in or the community in which they were worshiping for their adulthood. And uh, they've started these organizations. And not infrequently, I heard people saying that they were finding a kind of spiritual consolation and, and uh, accompaniment. I really like that term, uh, Angie, uh, in, within their organizations. Um, but I also heard, and this might be heartening for you, Amy, and for me, uh, well, I guess for all three of us up here, we're, we're sort of, uh, <laughs> I remember Angie, you once said, like, religion, do your job. Yeah. Um, I, I think that not infrequently, I also heard social entrepreneurs wishing to affiliate with communities of faith in their area and just not sure how to do so. Sometimes churches were behaving uh, in rather territorial fashion uh, it, sort of um, a, a, a kind of requirements for affiliation that were just too difficult for the social entrepreneurs. And so it was just easier to disaffiliate. Um, so that, I think that there's an impulse to affiliate, but not always a clarity on how to do that. I was kind of asking that tongue in cheek because I was telling you earlier I met the founder of SoulCycle this summer and I said to her, I hate you, you're my competition, <laughs> you know, and we ended up hanging out and having a really great time. She's a really wonderful person. But what we found at Riverside was, especially after the election, the presidential election, our sanctuary was filled with under 40 
like filled people looking for meaning, looking for purpose, and 70 to 75 percent of folks joining our community in the last three years are under the age of 40. So um, are you seeing trends like that, particular to this moment in which we find ourselves in this country in particular? Right, yeah. right. I mean, talk about this moment. I, I just spent two days at the Institute for the Future Forecasting Summit talking about what's coming, but you don't even have to go to the future. If you just, I mean, whether it's the social and political context in the US, whether it's the rise of artificial intelligence, whether it's questions about ethics and tech, you know, what uh, the the, cr the crises of our time, we more acutely than ever need the ancient wisdom that is our inheritance. And these questions of what it means to be human and why we matter and where we're going, those could not be more profound and they're getting more and more acute as these, as these things happen. And so it's really a question, I think, of how do you we talk sometimes about unbundling and remixing as something that people are already doing in their lives, that they may not be as traditionally affiliated, although many people still are, um, but even if they are, people, you can't help in many cases but be exposed to um, information and perspectives coming from different streams and, and beginning to bring those together, right? So people are cobbling together a spiritual life where they might be, you know, it, it might be a combination of, okay, I grew up Christian, but it was really only on holidays, but then I've been going to Shabbat Lux with my friends and I love the Beyonce mass and I do meditation with this one, you know, like there's a cobbling that happens. And so people are unbundling from the, um, the, the sense of having a cohesive story and identity and community. And so then it becomes a question of if we are, many of us sort of spiritually homeless <laughs> or spiritually independent in some way, how do you then come together in a way that allows for depth, knowing how important community is to meaning? Um, so I think that's part of the, but the, the role of our, our traditions in that process is um, vital. Yes. So we want to open up the mic to anybody who would like to, if you would mind going back to the mic and speaking loudly so everyone can hear. Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. Diane Johnson. Um, and I'm so delighted about this panel, although I'm bummed that it was at nine o'clock on Friday. I feel like it should have been on the main stage on the first day to like kick off the whole thing, but. Um, so I have a comment and then I have a question. One of the things I think is really fascinating is the conflation of purpose and spirituality and faith, right? So I think it's really, because when we talk about spirituality, um, that, right, we know that that's distinct from faith, institutional religion, and, and purpose, and in my work, both in working with denominations as well as social entrepreneurs, and now actually, here's a little plug, um, or conscious capitalism, which is really interesting, which has their four values as purpose, um, leadership, um, I can't remember what, it, uh, can't remember the other two right now. But so I'm, I'm fascinated by, right, the, the intrinsic desire to belong, and yet, the space is about, so where does that happen? So as an ordained minister, it's kind of weird that like somebody from SoulCycle is being asked to marry people. It's like, oh, okay. But, <laughs> right. but, but it speaks to, again, that, that longing, right? And where do we find connection? So I'm curious for the three of you, um, um, what do you think, what individual practices or inquiry help people understand the distinction between spirituality and purpose? Do you, do you understand my question? Like what, or even in your stories, what life experiences help people notice the difference between a sense of calling and what might be spirituality, which is very, very distinct from what people's faith is if they have it at all. And just a little plug also that let's be clear that there are other amazing traditions that are not just Christian or Judeo-Christian. Yeah, right? for sure. To the max. Um, my very brilliant colleagues over here probably have something more scientific to say about this, but I would say um, 
what distinguishes it and what I've seen over the course of my 20 plus years in ordained ministry is relationship. Relationship is how we begin to form identity, values, understand our faith in a way that has heft. And um, the work of a pastor, in my view, is to walk alongside people as they're discovering this. And I guess now the soul cycle teacher, too. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely underscore that. I think it's, um, it's become one of the kind of anecdotal metrics for deep communities is when people who become part of them leave their jobs or change jobs because of having discovered a sense of vocational calling that was not being lived into in the life they were leading. So there, but that can only happen in the context of relationship where your gifts are seen. Um, I know Damon is in the audience here and the story of his congregation is one that we turn to a lot because it is based on discovering the gifts of those in the congregation and then drawing them out and allowing them to be shared. Yeah. So thanks for your question. Um, in my, so I'm just going to draw on my data here. Uh, it felt like almost every conversation that I uh, came into, people began by saying, now we're making a distinction between spirituality and religion, right? So I in, in my data, at least, people are not conflating them. They, they keep them pretty distinct. Um, so uh, as a person of faith uh, who also seeks to be spiritual or spiritually invested, um, I guess I see a, two kinds of dangers uh, to avoid. On the one hand, I don't want to collapse religiosity into spirituality. I did meet people who wanted to do that. And on the other hand, I don't want to collapse spirituality into religiosity. I guess I see them as having a, a kind of uncanny border country that people are navigating all the time and just trying to like make sense of, of things. Some, so I have one really quick story where the, this border country was really apparent. I visited, uh, did some field research in CARA in Chicago, a job training organization, a pretty significant large one in, in Chicago, and it is a... It, describes itself as a secular organization. Um, but they have this amazing morning ritual thing that they do. So, you know, somebody studying spirituality, I had to go to this. And it's, it's, it's enormously, effectively overwhelming. Uh, but they, they have, a, a, like, concentric circles of people. And in the very central circle, uh, there is, like, this group of people whooping it up, like, giving high fives and cheering and and eventually somebody grabs a mic steps into the circle and it quiets the hubbub quiets down and then they have to answer some kind of prompt for the morning it might be like what do you want in your obituary or uh, some what, what's a recent experience where you've you learned that you were wrong and that was a good thing or something like that but here's the kicker like I feel like I could do almost any of that but then you have to conclude by singing something and so, which I, that would be very challenging for me. Uh, uh, so, so you might like one person that morning saying, "Do wa diddy dum diddy do," you know, like some kind of like a, a a rock song or something. Or you might sing, but this one woman uh, sang from a revivalist chorus of the 19th century, uh, "Blessed Assurance," and the, the the part that she sang. She was trying to keep it religiously neutral, so she, because she sort of understood the the culture of the place, and so it was like, this is my story, this is my song, and then she had affixed a couplet to the end of it that was like non-religious, but she didn't even get to sing it. The crowd, which was religiously diverse, uh, I think I had seen a Muslim young man stand up, and I think there were people who were of no faith at all, and so forth. But the crowd finished the song for her as it was originally written with explicitly Christian lyrics. And so that for me is kind of mysterious. What's going on there? Uh, is that a collapse? Is that a, like a loss of pluralism? Is that a failure of democracy? You know, sort of pluralistic democracy? Or was it a group of people from many different standpoints helping somebody else sing their own song? Thank you. 
So a lot of this conversation um, reminds me of the work of Carl Jung, the depth psychologist, um, and just kind of two observations. Um, one is that I think one of his really brilliant things was to connect psychology with religion. And so for, for atheists like myself, the, it's a way to really have a religious attitude about life um, by being psychological instead of religious. Uh, the second point is just the title of this, Money and Meaning, in that field, depth psychology, they talk about the ego self-axis, where the ego is really kind of your wor your, the world out here, which might correspond to money, and the self is your inner self, right, which corresponds to meaning, and the importance of having a healthy connection on that axis. So, anyway. Thank you. Kevin? I'm curious, in your research, if you um, talk to immigrants whose survival is based on mutual survival as opposed to being atomized and disconnected. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, um, I think one of the innovators who comes to mind is a a woman named Rosa Velasquez, who I've worked a fair amount with over the last two years, who's she particularly works with, with dreamers, and um, sh we. Uh, it's interesting. This uh, this kind of intersects with the the money and meaning conversation because um, part of where our work has gone in the last year or so has been to work with. Expli explicitly secular organizations who are realizing that they're now bearing a responsibility for some of these questions of meaning and belonging and purpose, and that people are coming there expecting to receive these things even at work. And so uh, Rosa was part of a pilot um, testing a new app that is dedicated to helping to alleviate suffering in moments when people are feeling a sense of acute emotional crisis. And so it's drawing on religious or spiritual practices from across religious traditions, um, but distilling them into something that you can actually look at in a moment of um, that, that the mandate was in an office bathroom. <laughs> um, and so she really spoke, to, she was part of the testing group for this app and talked about how she was, how it interacted with um, the experience that she had, which to your point was differently from some of the other testers who were experiencing a more atomized lifestyle. She was like, I don't have that problem in my context, but I do have acute moments of emotional crisis where having something that I can turn to in this digital world made a difference and I came back to it and it reinforced my practice. So it was really, that's, I mean, that is one very discreet anecdote, but it spoke to um, what in, I think in her case, she affirmed that when she already was embedded in a context of community, having something like this was helpful. For many other people who don't already have that precedent of community basis, um, they didn't really know how to sustain practice over time. Um, and you know, it hasn't just been in context <coughs> of immigrants, like other people who tested it, um, my friend Sam who works a lot in, in trans advocacy and works on a lot of crisis hotlines, um, also was one who said, I needed to find something like this and a, a spiritual connection in order to sustain me in this work, right? Which Rosa also attested to. Um, but ultimately it was that combination of personal practice and community basis um, that allowed her to carry on doing it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's, that's not really answering my question. It, you know, did you find in your research people who were connected as immigrants are with, in mutual dependency, and, and did they have the atomized sense that you had in your research? Craig, I guess, would be more to you. So I have not interviewed any um, international refugees, but I, I have talked to people who are somewhat refugees from mainstream institutions. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about people in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago, which is uh, frequently sort of cast in the news as a terrifically violent, uh, bullet-ridden place. Um, and yeah, you know, that's a, an unfortunate uh, narrative, to, to put it mildly, because yeah. right? it's a place that's vibrant and, and full of uh, abundance and, and 
sort of uh, wealth building, honestly. But I, I talked with a man who more or less founded, he would deny this, but he more or less founded uh, a cafe in, in, on a, a 69th Street. And I met him in this cafe. And um, I think that the story that he would tell is that he didn't found this place. In fact, if you walk in there and say, could I speak with a manager who owns this place? The people behind the <coughs> counter will say, you do. It's a, it's a community-owned place. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that the story of this cafe, the Kusanya Cafe, is a story not of like some brilliant innovation, um, but instead like a recognition of what was already going on, an instantiation of what was already going on in the, in the community. It was an expression of the community. And when the community saw it, they, uh, there are no bars over the windows in this institution. Um, the community said, yeah, that's us. Um, so in that sense, they're not refugees maybe, but they're people uh, who are recognizing spiritual connectedness. Hi, my name is Kieran, um, and I'm a millennial, and I run an organization called Consult Your Community, and we're a series of volunteer organizations on over 22 college campuses. Um, my question, is, well, I have a, a very silly question, which is, what is Beyonce Mass? And I have a more serious question, um, which is, you know, I find it really fascinating um, the intersection that you're talking about, about spirituality and religion, and I think there's like several trends um, that people have talked about, for example, rise of social media and, and creating loneliness, um, the desire for idols. I think Beyonce is a good example. Like people still seek an idol in some way, even if it's kind of agnostic to a religious affiliation. Um, what, are, what are the ways in which you've seen people grouping um, and what, you know, kind of outside of religion in clusters, maybe outside of volunteer service? And then two, why do you think they have such an aversion towards religion apart from, you know, what you see in the media, if there's something more core and intrinsic. Um, yeah, so I know that was a lot of questions. Feel I'll take the Beyonce this. mass one. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a minister in California who has written a liturgy using Beyonce's music, and um, Marvin White. Marvin White. No, 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 it's, it's, it's Yolanda. Yeah, it's Yolanda. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so she goes around and produces this mass, and it's, like, huge. I mean, there's, like, lighting and sound, and, um, and it just draws all kinds of people in, which says something about what Beyonce is doing in her work, which is deeply spiritual and justice-making. Um, but, yeah, check it out. You can check it out online. Okay, I think I got the last part, but um, I, I mean, just to the question of uh, the aversion, I guess. I mean, I think that one thing that's important to know is just from a purely statistical standpoint, there's sometimes a perception that millennials or members of Gen Z are um, sort of regularly rejecting uh, religion. So in like a Jewish context that every weekend they might be deciding not to go to synagogue, right? But usually it's not, um, there's a majority of millennials who either were not raised in a singular religious tradition or in any tradition at all is a growing, um, is a growing population. So it's not just that they're, that they've actively experienced something and rejected it, but that they never had it to begin with, so, or that they had multiplicity, right? Like being raised, I had a friend in Div School who was raised Catholic and Lutheran, and she's like, I'm both, <laughs> you know? Or someone who was raised in something discovered something else. So there's that context, and then there's, and then beyond that, there's things that you might be able to, to point to, and all of us could point to, right? As far as, you know, whether it's, perceived or otherwise, but whether it's that you yourself have been rejected by the community for some aspect of your identity, whether it's that you perceive there to be hypocrisy or that the use of money is something you can't tolerate or the creed is not something you can consent to, you know, things like that. So, yeah. It really helps when Goldsboro Baptist Church shows up at prominent events with their horrible and hateful signs and everybody sees that and thinks that's organized religion. Right. And shame on us for letting that happen. 
Hi friends, I'm Mary Jane Fox and I'm a professor of economics and finance at a Jesuit university and I'm also a spiritually seeking unaffiliated millennial. And um, in my classes, when I teach conventional economic classes, I really watch my language. I try and use words, words like nourish and nurture and you know the idea that the economy is what can, can be seen as one of the mechanisms that connects us and that it's relational. And this is really different if you take my econ class, the same class, like basic ma macroeconomics compared to some of my um, colleagues. So my first question is about language and money and spirituality. It's broad, but please take it at wherever you wish. And then my second quick question is around the concept of Sabbath and work and money. So, um, I'm reading a book titled Sabbath, and I'm thinking a lot about what I'm teaching my students around working hard and, and students wanting to make money and, and wanting to do good in the world, but also wanting to honor rest and what Sabbath might mean. So I'm curious if you've heard about that in any of your research or commentary that people make when they've earned a lot of money and they've, they're working hard in their business, um, what Sabbath looks like for them. Thank you. Oh, those are, are big big questions. Um, just on the, on the issue of money, I think um, the, the in institutional church, where I was, I'm, I'm speaking from my perspective, has done a terrible job of modeling the use and um, um, of, of, of our resources to change and invest in the world. And what we've created is what you were saying, like this fear-based like, model of scarcity. And um, it's, it's really important that in whatever way we come to find meaning, we begin to talk about a new economy. We begin to talk about an economy of abundance, about like looking into the communities where we are and seeing the things that are growing and, and celebrating those things because that's where the church to me has become, um, has gotten in bed with empire and capitalism and it does not reflect the economy of God, which is, you know, don't worry about what you wear. Like, look at all the abundance around you. Open your heart and share with everybody. So I don't know if that means anything. I only took one economics class in college. I, I got an A, though. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I'm just so happy for your students that yeah. you, in your role, are exploring these questions and bringing them to bear. So thank you for doing that. Um, I think if you haven't, you should read The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist, <laughs> who is right over there. Um, and or is it Sabbath? Because there are a couple great ones, but Wayne Muller's book is good. Is that the one you're reading? Okay. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, one thing just as a premise, and I think this speaks to what you're saying, um, Amy, is so much, and I've experienced this personally, as I think a lot of us have, and part of this is also just, I mean, it's, when you talk about empire, part of this is coming definitely from white culture, is the, like, the notion that your value is what you produce. Um, and so a lot of bad theology has come about that basically says the same thing. <laughs> um, and so, we always start with belonging <laughs> of you are unconditionally beloved, period. And then from that place, <laughs> you know, um, it comes an invitation to, to, to give what is yours to give and to, to grow into who you are and can be in the, in the sense of um, our togetherness. But I think that's part of where even an orientation that would allow for Sabbath Yes. comes from, right? Because there is no Sabbath if your value is based on your production mechanism as an oh. entity, That's right? So the fact that we would be treated as consumers rather than as, you know, um, beloveds. <laughs> it's yeah. beautiful, beautiful. One last question. Sure. Uh, first of all, th thank you for this panel. This is... Uh, two this two is more questions. Very, sorry. Thank you for this panel. It's very refreshing, and I get your point on why is it on a Friday morning. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, I'd like the panel's uh, in, uh, ideas on where in this world of hyper-accelerated individual choice that everybody has, where they get to choose the exact expression of spirituality or religion that works for them, it, it, it's like a cafe tray where they say, I want the yoga, but I don't want the Sunday service. I, you know, where in that world 
Is there a role for accountability and things that are external to you that hold you accountable and challenge you? Because the value that I get from my faith community is I meet people that I normally wouldn't meet. Right. Right. I'm challenged with ideas that I don't immediately agree with or even understand, but it forces me to grapple with it and it deepens my understanding of what it is to be a religious or a spiritual person. Where in the world that most of us are inhabiting, where we're all just choosing easy things that fit with us, what replaces or what, what gives us that external accountability that makes us truly spiritual and religious? I'm going to let you talk about this per your research, but one of the most, before then, really quickly, one of the most interesting um, relationships I've formed this year is with two young entrepreneurs who are developing an app called Venly, V-E-N-N-L-Y, and it's like a curation of spiritual guidance. So spiritual leaders from all over every tradition and no tradition talking for a short amount of time about grief, about relationships, about whatever. So you can get a meditation app. Well, this is more like a content app, right? But that's my critique of what they're doing. Like, because ultimately I think we have to have community and accountability in that community. But thoughts? Yeah. Amen to this question. <laughs> this is, this is the call to creativity of this time, I think. Um, to the point that, you know, a lot of my work has been like writing reports on changes in the spiritual and community landscape. And we had written five of them. And then we were going to write one on formation, talking about a word that Beyonce has popularized in the culture, um, but that is a religious word talking about, you know, how we grow spiritually, basically. And we were going to write a report on it. And then instead, we ended up doing a pilot because it wasn't enough just to write about it. The feeling that we needed spaces to grow in community and be, be held to account um, was too great. So we just actually finished it last week. It was a year-long pilot of spiritual formation in community for people across and outside of religious traditions and across geographies um, in the attempt to find some way in a context where so many people are cobbling it together <laughs> to actually grow and to be faced with the things that are uncomfortable, which, by the way, will happen anyway and are happening you know I had a, a friend who came into divinity school as a self-professed new age sparkle pony and within a month of starting school her mother passed away and she was like I don't where where do I land here like I have nothing what do I draw from um, in this time where I am feeling such acute and existential need um, so it's there are this is another area where, you know, to the thing of like religion, do your job. I so deeply desire for that. I, I was at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Boston and there were two women sitting next to each other. One who was like leading the charge on the housing bill. And so she stood up and said her piece about why everyone should vote for it. And then the woman sitting next to her stood up. She was the one leading the organizing against it. And then they sat back down and one put her arm around the other. They're friends. They're part of this congregation together, and they disagree on this issue. That's religion at its best. Yes. Diamond. So, Amy, you, uh, to paraphrase something, we've been schooled in scarcity. And ever since 1929, the uh, stock market, that whole era, we built things that are manufacturing. If that's the case, and there are abundant people that live in the communities, most of them not here, um, how do we cultivate a fabric or structure, for the lack of a better term, that sees and practice abundance in institutions? That's a question for you, Diamond. That's what you do. <laughs> but, but no, I meant for the bigger church, our bishops, they think so scarce. Our judicaries, rich, white, mostly um, men, uh, think that the thing is inside the church, and I'm United Methodist, and I'm Wesleyan. I would say the world is our parish. And how do, what is it that we have to do to, th to think about all the people that worship also have a vocation in secular life, and they live out their faith in ways, or they think about it? How do we cultivate a structure that we celebrate that on all denomination and annual conferences that we don't celebrate the work of the poor. Coming back full circle to having just pastored this huge 
church founded by John Rockefeller and the $150 million endowment, I will say like those structures do not change easily. They don't change. And so I'm so excited about this moment in organized institutional religion because we're so desperate. We'll try anything. Thanks be to God, you know? So we're gonna, we need to be, begin to articulate a different theology of economy and to go where God's work is happening in the world, whether it belongs to us or not. And so I'm hoping that desperation is gonna be the kickoff for this. Oh, one thing I, I think when you said articulating this better, Amy, I, I think the thing we need to do is tell better stories um, which is, I mean, not, this is coming out of my research, but people who are telling stories that are grounded in their own agency um, and in their own innovativeness and in their own inspiration, that's a good story. It's an important story. But I don't think it's a, it's a sufficient story. And so I think telling stories that pay attention to not just our inward lives, but our amongness lives, the, the lives in between us all, um, those are the best stories I've been hearing, the, the most encouraging, and the ones that most change my attention. If I've had any conversion in doing this research, it is a complication of my attention. I, I began, honestly, by sort of looking at people's inward lives, or trying to, and I've, I've ended up, uh, at least where I am right now, in paying attention to what's going on among us. Yeah, I was... Um working in the Parliament of the World's Religions, and there was a young woman who was talking to a, a mentor of mine who is dearly beloved, an older white man, uh, and it was back when they were trying to decide whether Mormons would be allowed in the Parliament of the World's Religions, and this young woman just like, you know, kind of whispered in his ear, she's like, are you gonna move on this, or we do we need to just wait for you all to die? <laughs> um, you know, and that's a kind of, a blunt way to put it, but I think part of what has made it so powerful to me to get to know a few of these um, Catholic sisters that I've been working with is there's an ex some of it seems to come from the experience of loss and then moving through loss and developing the spiritual maturity that can happen on the other side of that to actually see um, that another way is possible. And Sister Carol Zinn has said, you know, ours was a radical response to the gospel in our time and place, and now that time and place is changing, and the spirit is moving, and how beautiful would it be if we were there to meet it? Oh, I wish there were more people who were doing that. And that was beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friends. Thank you for your inspiring work. Thanks for being in this conversation with us today.